Um, this brings us to our uh, next session. Uh, we shall now uh, we shall now call upon Dr. Anandan to elaborate on how AI can provide new ways of approaching pro problems and meaningfully improving people's lives. Dr. Anandan is the CEO of Vadwani Institute of Artificial Intelligence since its inception. Prior to this, Dr. Anandan has held research leadership positions at Adobe Research Lab and at Microsoft Research in India. Over to you, Dr. Anandan. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you, uh, Prerna. And uh, I'll firstly, especially want to thank my friends Larry and uh, Silesh uh, for getting me, inviting me to this. And of course, great to meet uh, Uday uh, in the forum as well. And of course, uh, always a privilege to do anything with uh, Dr. Michelle Karzindi as one of the preeminent scientists. And and to follow Ms. Anna Roy, uh, always a tough thing, but I'll try to do my best. So what I'm going to do is to actually uh, start uh, sharing a presentation and uh, you know take you through that. So I'm going to try to share the screen. Hopefully, uh, okay. right. so, uh, yeah, I assume uh, people can see my presentation. If not, someone uh, shout out because at the, I'm, at the moment I'm only looking at the screen. So. So actually, oh, sorry, it's not it's starting at the end. OK, here we go. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that people can see this because I'm sharing the screen. Let me just check in the other one if anybody. Yeah, cool. OK, yeah. So in fact, I retitled this a little bit because uh, we have been around for a couple of years and you know have actually learned a few things. And uh, very early on, about two and a little more than, little less than two and a half years ago, a little more than two and a half years ago now, I guess, yeah, we had the honor and privilege of being inaugurated by the Prime Minister, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Narendra Modi. And uh, very soon after that, in fact, we had an opportunity to work with uh, Niti, and, and we have been continuing to do so. Our mission has always been to look at how AI can help poor and underserved communities in India, but throughout the world as well. Uh, and one of the points of uh, departure here is that if you look at current AI, current AI trends, most of the technology that's being already being used, be it e-commerce or social network or uh, ride share, uh, you know, anything to do with finance management, banking, very rapidly growing, self-driving cars, little of this will appear, apply to about 3 billion people in the world who live in uh, poor communities, villages, in India, in Africa, in Latin America, in other parts of the, uh, you know, the global south, as it's sometimes called, and we realize that as much as uh, these technologies are not immediately applicable to them, the need there is great. In fact, one of the reasons why a lot of these communities are, uh, you know, uh, under under uh, underserved is because expert capacity in any domain, either in health or agriculture expertise, or uh, you know, in uh, financial inclusions, credit giving, or in education, in all of them, the expert uh, tech, you know, uh, availability is limited. Expert capacity is limited, and expertise is not there. And so it, this is a place where it seems like a decision-making technology, such as AI, can actually help augment the human capacity. So with that in mind, let me start with a short video. What you're seeing here is a newborn baby. Uh, that's being weighed uh, at a home setting. And the lady behind in blue is, I think, the mother. Uh, the woman in the front who's weighing is a frontline health worker. And the other one is uh, maybe a friend or something. And notice how this process is really a bit cumbersome. It requires a spring balance. And the weight has to be taken as accurately as they can. However, given the cumbersome of the process, and often you know, spring balances may not be available in such, you find things like this. Uh, if you look at this chart, you will notice that over a period of uh, eight months, this particular frontline health worker has marked all the babies to be a 2.500 uh, kilogram. Clearly, this can't be right. And why is this the number? Because it turns out 2.5 kilograms is the threshold below which a baby is considered underweight and needs some special attention. 1.8 kilograms is uh, severely underweight and needs critical care. So instead of weighing the baby, uh, perhaps you know they make up these numbers based on looking at the baby. Looks the baby looks healthy, so let's write this number. And this is not because they are not uh, they are bad people. It's because a lot of issues, supply chain issues with respect to the balances, their maintenance, and so on, 
uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, concern about what will happen to the data, how it will be used. And, and not to forget that in many uh, families, uh, touching a baby in the beginning is limited to family members. External members are not allowed to touch a baby. So what we find is about 4 million uh, low birth weight babies in India that are not actually uh, noticed. And in fact, this is one of the big indicators of early childhood problems and can lead to anything from sepsis to mortality. And so we looked at it and said, can we uh, come up with an alternate solution? The approach that uh, we have taken is actually to use a computer vision based approach, uh, take a short video of the baby using uh, a simple smart phone that a frontline health worker these days has, create a 3D model of the baby based on these images. And one of the nice things about this is that babies you know, are in a narrow range of shapes. I mean, babies don't look like cars and chairs. So we can actually parameterize the baby uh, model in a particular way and recover those parameters and, and, and detect and, and compute the 3D model of the baby from which we can compute the volume. As it happens that babies tend to be mostly water. Their density is about 1.03 newborns. And from that, we can estimate the weight. So this is a technology we started working little less than two years ago. And what we are finding is that uh, currently, you know, uh, under hospital settings, like you see in this picture, the, what you see is uh, the 3D model superimposed on the uh, baby. We are getting uh, very good performance in terms of uh, sensitivity, sensitivity and recall. Um, in fact, this is a result we achieved uh, sometime last fall. And this is from the Nilofar Hospital in Hyderabad, where did a significant amount of data collection. Now, one of the things that I will mention as I go along is that a lot of what you might assume as data required for doing AI is simply not available in the social domain. And you have to create your pathways for data collections yourself. And data collection has to cover the range of cases. So uh, earlier this year, we started collecting data in community settings, home settings. And as you can see here, there is a variety of background. Lighting conditions can be varied, uh, poor illumination and such. However, initially, what we are finding, if you look at the projections of the 3D models on the babies, as you see in the pictures below, they're not looking bad. So we are quite uh, hopeful. Uh, we are doing uh, this kind of field data collection. However, uh, earlier this year, once COVID came, this work had to stop and it has just restarted again. So at the moment, we feel confident about our hospital setting uh, uh, you know, a solution, but we have to extend it to community setting. How do we plan to deploy this? Actually, there are two major programs uh, that's worth uh, talking about. Uh, the one program is called uh, the uh, Potion Abiyan, or sometimes known as uh, the Anganwadi program. This is from the Ministry of uh, you know, Women and Child Development. There are about I believe uh, 1.3, roughly 1.2, 1.3 million uh, Anganwadi workers in the country who are more concerned about nutrition. They are not actually concerned about newborn uh, sepsis and health. But however, as a part of their nutrition mission, they do uh, have to take weight and other measurements of the baby. But it's uh, one of the reasons for that program to be attractive is that about half of them, 600,000, already have uh, you know, an app called the Common Application Software that they are routinely using. So when you think about uh, you know, apply, using these technologies, if there is not a digital pathway for deployment, you're not going to get anywhere. So we want to rely on places where there is a digital pathway, and the uh, Anganwadi program provides such. The other program, which is more directly concerned with uh, homeborn neonatal care, which is called, which is you know, part of the ASHA program, uh, which is from the Ministry of Health, is also something where we can look at. However, um, in, you know, at the moment, uh, not all of them are endowed with a smartphone and an app and so on. So this is a, a kind of something that's getting started. In particular, we found that the state of Gujarat has a slightly advanced uh, level of uh, work in this area, and we are collaborating with an organization there to see if we can, uh, you know, deploy our technology through an app on one of their, uh, you know, one of their phones. So this is the pathway that we are currently doing. We are expecting to do some uh, field trials and pilots by the end of the year and do a full-scale pilot probably uh, middle of some time next year. And uh, in fact, uh, Ms. Anarai mentioned about our working with Niti. In fact, this is one of the areas uh, we are co working with Niti to see where we can do the piloting and deployment. Let me switch over to a different problem, cotton farming. Cotton is one of the most important cash crops for Indian farmers. Uh, and there are about 100 million farmers, uh, 100 million families in India who are uh, cotton farming families. 
<coughs> most of them are small hold, holder farms, meaning one acre, two acres, so not a lot of land. And deploying advanced technology in this is quite challenging. Uh, however, uh, you know they, they also don't have uh, the latest and greatest knowledge. Certainly not uh, IT and AI type technologies. One of the challenges that we discovered, there are many aspects to the cotton growing problem, not covering that here. But one of the challenges we discovered was pest infestation. There are, as, I, as you see here, about 150 different pests and variety of pesticides produced by variety of different companies. So it's very confusing for the farmer when to use it you know, and what to use and so forth. And so there is a, actually a system approach, which I'll mention uh, momentarily. But it turns out about, about four to six pests are extremely critical. And so you don't have to try to solve the 150 pest problem immediately. One of the things that happens is that our agriculture extension workers that visit these farms on a weekly basis, and they go to what are called demo plots in a village. There are like two of them, and there is a farmer who is sometimes called the lead farmer. They, one, amongst the various things that they do is in fact uh, counting pests. And uh, again, I'll come to the method of how they count the pests, but that information is entered into an IT system called source trace. And however, uh, this counting is not very uh, reliable. Uh, counting pests, is, uh, you know, identifying the pests, counting them can be challenging for very many reasons. So what they do now is to aggregate this information from about a block of 100 villages and issue a common advisory. And as you can imagine, this second pass, uh, process, which requires expert uh, you know, management, can be quite slow. It takes about two weeks. And the advisory is not local. It's too broadly uh, spread and it's not often as useful as you would like it to be. So we saw an opportunity where the kind of yellow uh, sticky paper that you see here is the kind of pest traps that they already use. There is also a different kind of uh, pest trap called pheromone traps. And there are two broad ca categories of pests, what are called bollworms. I'm not showing them here. These are called sucking insects, which can be captured by these uh, sticky paper. And they are very small. And you can see on the right, our AI has detected which ones are the various types of sucking insects and is able to count them. In the bollworms are a little bigger, but they're actually more dangerous. In 2016-17, about 50% of the crop uh, in the state of Maharashtra was lost to the bollworms. So here in the middle picture, for example, you see the bollworms. And the way they do it is to set up a trap, as you see in the photo on the left, uh, kind of a funnel in which the, uh, they put some pheromone and uh, attract the pests and then empty them on a uh, paper and count them. What we are doing now is replacing the human counting with the machine counting. And this uh, works quite well already, over 90% accuracy. And we have integrated into some of the apps that the uh, people are using. So this work is a little bit more advanced uh, and also able to uh, you know, provide multilingual support and stuff. So one of the first things, again, we did, this, this was done about two years, let's say between 2018 Karif season and 2019 summer. We collected a lot of photographs, had the farmers and extension workers upload them, and had uh, people, expert entomologists, annotate them. So we have a huge database of these that have served our uh, solution. And so the basic idea is really to uh, take a picture and uh, identify first where the trap is, and then start counting and produce the result. And this actually is uh, good enough to go out and uh, use on a regular basis. Uh, and so one of the things we decided is that uh, we need to do the field trials, of course, but a challenge with respect to cotton, of course, is that it's a seasonal crop. In most of India, it's grown only in the Karif season, which is July to January. So we have to like do one set of trials in uh, 2000, you know, 2018, we got the data. 2019, we did a set of trials uh, with about 150 farmers in the Wada districts and about 30 farmers in the Kutch district. However, we were also able to do some work uh, in the summer this year in Karnataka, uh, you know, because there's a seasonal, there is a set of farmers in Karnataka who actually plant uh, cotton in the summer and had a good set of learnings. Now, people are quite interested in this technology. We are able to work with uh, private foundations like Wellspun Foundation and Deshpande Foundation in addition to the government itself. And one of the advantages of the private foundation programs is that they usually have are connected to uh, some sort of a trade, uh, you know, network, and are much more motivated to make sure that these things work. We found that the usage of this technology uh, was quite good, and people were able to use it well. But there was a one fundamental uh, problem we discovered, which is that 
uh, if there is no pest attack for a couple of years, say 2016, 17, there were pest attacks, but 18, there wasn't. So 19, nobody wanted to even set up the traps. And the current protocol requires three continuous days of visits and taking photos, and farmers are not uh, willing to do that. So we are now looking at uh, a different approach for uh, taking photographs. We think that a single image uh, uh, taken along with contextual information about you know, various factors related to the form, the climate and the soil and so on can be enough to uh, detect the pests and identify when there is threat. It's not so much the detecting the pest alone. Uh, there is a scientific approach to decide on what is the threshold above which the pest infestation is considered dangerous. So we are now uh, you know, switching over to a single image visit approach that we are going to try out. In fact, we are currently doing this as the season has begun and working with these uh, foundations. And hopefully that uh, we can eliminate some of the usage risks associated with the protocol by taking this approach. And that will then lead us to doing some significant uh, you know, piloting next year. Hope, yeah. By the way, just want to mention that uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, Google issued a call for uh, AI um, impact challenge. And there were about 2,600 uh, proposals. And there were about 25 or so selected. And uh, we were one of the top ones. And we got about uh, $2 million from Google for this work. Let me now switch gears again to uh, another health problem. TB, as you know, is one of the uh, you know most severe diseases. And what a lot of people don't know is that TB actually kills more people than HIV and malaria combined on an annual basis. And there are about 10 million TB cases in the world and about one and a half million deaths uh, in 2018. And yet, you know, many of these cases go unreported. India is one of the leading countries with respect to TB, in, you know, uh, uh, you know, situation. And however, there is a huge set of problems with this, which is, as I said already about, uh, you know, many of the people that are actually having TB are not even uh, detected. Some of them go to private sector and then they are not notified by the government. Uh, what the government finds is about 48% of the known cases are uh, not notified. Uh, and then, you know, there are various things with respect to the diagnosis and treatment. But one severe problem really has to do with adherence of the uh, uh, drug treatment and many TB patients, uh, you know, this uh, drugs are very toxic and there can be a cocktail of drugs that you have to take for six months. And about six weeks into the treatment, you might feel better. Often people stop taking the drugs, which leads to, of course, uh, reinfection and uh, drug resistant bacteria. And these days there are extremely drug resistant bacteria. So catching and making sure that TB drug uh, taking is adhered to is actually an important challenge. We in India, we get about about 400,000 uh, TB deaths annually as a result of the failure in the various parts. One good thing is that India has got a, a system of care for TB, uh, uh, part of the health ministry called the Central TB Division. It has agencies and offices in every state and is well funded and have programs that they run. Early on, we realized that if we want to make a difference to TB, the best way to do that is to work with the Central TB Division. So about a year or so ago, we signed an MOU uh, to become the AI partner for the Central DB Division. Uh, this got the attention of USAID and the Gates Foundation, uh, who offered us uh, some significant additional funding. And now we are very much in uh, in the track of working with uh, the uh, you know Central DB Division. The way this works in terms of TB adherence is that uh, you have to make sure that somebody uh, actually takes that drug. So there is this. Uh, uh, method called directly observable therapy system dots program and but that requires a you know a human to go in and watch this so it's not practical there are about 4000 uh, tb health visitors that are responsible for 1.3 million uh, patients so this system you know is understaffed obviously uh, there are a bunch of other uh, already existing electronic uh, you know and other kinds of tools that are in play they vary in cost 99 dots which is developed originally in Microsoft Research India, and now you know, run by a company called Everwell, which which was a uh, spin-off from MSR India, uh, is one of the leaders in terms of adherence monitoring. They have a solution called Missed Call, but with all of that, there is still significant gaps. So, in talking to CTD, what we realize that if we can predict uh, when a patient is likely to miss beforehand, rather than react to after they have stopped taking drugs, can we proactively predict, and therefore, you know, the health visitors can prioritize 
those patients uh, you know before others so this is a problem that we have started working on and based on some initial data this looks like a very uh, you know ai can be very effective in predicting uh, behaviors such as uh, taking the drugs based on call histories and past behavior records and things like that uh, so one of the advantages of working with of course some organization like ctd is that whatever solution we develop will be implemented through the program and would scale immediately now i should also say earlier this year you know when covid happened uh, we got contacted by quite a number of our friends and partners uh, in fact i talked to silesh about this quite a bit in the early days and uh, realized that this is something we could work on while we are waiting for the world to you know come back to continue our other field trials and other projects so we kind of uh, identified two things we could do one is of course uh, testing is a real uh, problem because the tests are expensive so to the extent that if we could actually create, come up with a method of screening uh, you know uh, whether someone has covid or not and then test you know where it's necessary that might be a more effective way of using the tests so we have been working on a, a solution that would rely on cough sounds it can be natural cough or elicited cough uh, at the moment you know we have collected data in various cough facilities uh, the idea is to you know take some symptomatic information uh, record the cough analyze it using an ai and then come up with a recommendation that you are likely to be uh, you know covid positive or negative and that can become one of one more of the uh, symptoms if you will and that can be used in uh, reducing uh, the testing loads what we are finding is that uh, you know in a clinic setting we are able to do that well because data collection was much easier in that setting uh, at the moment i'll skip over and show uh, we are getting about uh 96 95 7% uh, sensitivity that means you know if you have a cough we'll find it but we have kind of optimized our roc to about 50% uh, uh, false uh, positive so that means sometimes when we say that uh, you have a cough you 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 know covid you may not but however that helps in the sense that whenever we say you don't have covid it's very likely to be the case so this you know chart sort of shows how we can reduce a test from 1000 people to say 484 people in order to achieve the same uh, type of end results which is about a 1.6 factor lift so we are currently entering a phase of uh, you know passive evaluation in some clinics in bihar and possibly in mumbai as well uh, the other thing that we realize is of course you know epidemiological modeling prediction etc was an important thing so we convened uh, together with the help of Indian Institute of Science and Tata Institute of uh, Fundamental Research and a few other tech partners, a, a kind of a consortium back uh, in about March and started thinking about how we can uh, work together. And we developed, uh, basically uh, identified a certain set of problems having to do with, it's not so much you know enough to predict whether you know number of cases is this much or that much, but how is it ultimately going to affect the health resource uh, you know requirements in other words how many icus will be needed how many cc ones and cc two and so on so we've been uh, working on that aspect but more recently we've gotten into a very close loop of working with uh, the bmc M mumbai corporation and what we are finding is that you know we have been giving them these kind of uh, requirements on a regular basis telling them that you're going to need so many icus you know in about 15 days time or three weeks time or something like that we try to stay ahead by about roughly between two weeks to a month and we are more confident about two weeks than month for example and that's been going on uh, what we find is what we learned in this is that actually it has to be a very close working situation uh, making the prediction and throwing that over to the decision makers is absolutely not enough because the kind of needs that they have does evolve and change so we have an ongoing engagement where you know the decision makers set up the priorities that helps us work with the you know the usually the cities have a war room uh, the war room staff to you know help us collect the data and do some forecasting and modeling and then review it and then go back to the team so we've been meeting with the bmc uh, officials uh, you know the additional chief commission uh, additional uh, BMC Commissioner Ms. Ashwini Bide has been one of our primary contacts on a roughly two to three week uh, rhythm. And we're finding not only can we do various types of predictions, but also looking at, at you know, where should testing be done? We can give them some indication of where the test results need to be higher, which wards at a what level. And also looking at uh, what is the nature of prevalence. And one of the things that in Mumbai that we have learned is that 
prevalence estimates show that team that you know what do you call prevalence seems to be much higher uh, you know in uh, slums than in non slums however this may be because of not adequate testing and things like that so this is an ongoing work we continue to work with bmc and now we are at a point where we are looking at whether we can package it and make it available for other uh, cities and states to use let me just quickly switch over to uh, some of the key learnings what i said are just examples and we are not going to stop there you know our ambition really is to create a, a pathway for uh, social uh, sector organizations and governments to work with technologists to you know address their needs and so what we are doing is not you know limited to us we are hoping to kind of generalize this through partnerships and we really have to bring together technologists domain researchers administration administrators and the final beneficiaries in in a really a convening situation in order to do them we also found that you know ai itself of course you know is not enough you need to turn it into a product or a solution but more importantly where there is a systems approach say such as the ctd or in the case of covid bmc care system or in the case of cotton farming these well spun foundation and others as well as the extension worker system wherever there is a system or the anganwadi program that's where the solution will actually be reliable so without a system in place you know we don't really try to do anything we know that there is this natural loop of problem definition identifying use cases data set creation data is not there uh, doing a tech poc turning it into a solution and piloting and iterating forever until we get to scale is important but what's unique about the social sector is that the capability to do the uh, field work the piloting and the use case definition and data set creation really lies in the hands of governments ngos and domain experts whereas the tech capabilities lying in the you know hands of tech organizations and research organizations and unless we are able to bridge those nothing can be done so we find ourselves naturally in a position you know where we are trying to tie these things together uh, you know before we do anything we ask these questions is this a big problem can it be solved by ai in fact will ai make ai part of it makes a big difference or the problem somewhere else perhaps and then of course you know what are the challenges in getting it accepted by stakeholders data of course is always a challenge and other execution organization who can co-create with us and bring them on board in the beginning and are there pathways to scale it's only based on how the these questions answer we select a problem so you know we're now up to about 70 people uh, you know researchers engineers product managers and program managers who have worked in public health and agriculture domain and people have come from a variety of organizations and as always i find that the brightest people that i work with are always the young fresh btech graduates and we have about 20 fresh btechs from the iits as our research fellows who i would say do all of the heavy lifting uh, i should thank our founder donors it's their vision that i'm executing uh, dr ramesh vadwani and mr sunil vadwani uh, tech entrepreneurs of indian origin from bombay both uh, place lived in, lived in most of their life in the us they have committed about 30 million dollars of their own money uh, for this effort over 10 years but you know they have let us uh, raise additional funds and i'm glad to say that we've been raised able to raise about uh, 17 18 million dollars already for to further support some of our work uh, with that i want to thank again uh, the organizers uh, geo and my friends for inviting me i will shop shop stop sharing um thank you so much uh, sir for a stimulating and practical session uh the applications of ai are often discussed in context uh, to its transformative abilities to various industries but it was great to see ai in action and supporting the grassroots level development uh, in the social space the great work at badhani ai under your leadership really showcases a new gamut of development opportunities which i hope will motivate our budding ai and ai and data scientists um to research and innovate in this space thank you once again Uh, so before we begin the panel discussion i would like to call upon our program mentors uh, professor larry bonbom and dr shailesh kumar the architects of uh, the digital symposium to share their thoughts um, professor larry is a faculty and former department chair of computer science northwestern university he is also the co-founder and chief scientific advisor at narrative science usa His research and teaching focuses on applied artificial intelligence, uh, natural language processing, intelligent information systems, um, social media, data analytics, machine learning, with applications to media and journalism. Uh, Professor Larry, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Prerna, and thank you all for joining us uh, this evening and hope you're all safe wherever you are in this complicated time. Um, I want to thank Anandan, first of all, for that fantastic talk. Uh, uh, I've known Anandan for a long time, longer than either of us would care to admit since we were both uh, junior professors at Yale umpty ump years ago. So uh, thank you for joining us, Anandan. Uh, I love the creativity of those applications and also the focus on the challenges of deployment and really how those two things interlock in, in, uh, in uh, making AI uh, really work. Um, I want to say a few words about the Geo Institute's AI and data science program, which I'm, uh, I have the privilege of helping to advise along with my friend, Dr. Shailesh Kumar. Um, Geo Institute uh, aspires uh, ultimately and fairly quickly to be a full spectrum university covering everything from, I imagine, art history to, to uh, computer science. But uh, we're starting with some point master's programs in AI and data science and digital media and marketing communications, which will quickly be added to over the coming years. Um, and uh, I think these are great programs to start with. Uh, I, we're starting at the master's level, so this university is growing from the middle out. Um, but uh, I think it's a great way to start. And one of the things that we're gonna focus on as we build the, the AI and digital uh, and data science program really is uh, not only education, but research, that we wanna actually from the very beginning, build research into the DNA of Geo Institute uh, as a university uh, at the master's level. And so our students will be able to uh, learn the fundamentals and learn how to, uh, um, to master those, but also they're gonna learn systems thinking and how to really do research and development and ultimately deployment in some of the ways that on and on just so creatively and excitingly showed are possible. Um, we're currently in the process of recruiting a great uh, set of visiting and full-time faculty, um, and uh, we'll shortly be uh, opening up for applications for the coming year and look forward to a great kickoff year next year starting in July. 